On the evening of October 7, 1998, an 18-year-old college freshman named Aaron Cry felt taking a bike ride outside Laramie in southeast Wyoming. Laramie is a small city in Albany County that's home to the University of Wyoming, and it's located right between two mountain ranges. So once you're out of the city, you're like out of the city in some pretty rugged country area. It's beautiful, though, and since Aaron's really into mountain biking, it's the perfect terrain for him to stay fit. All in all, he's having a great ride until he hits a rock near a split rail fence and falls off his bike. Now it's just a minor fall, and he's not hurt. But when he's getting up and dusting himself off, he notices something odd, slumped down and actually tied to the fence post. At first, Aaron thinks it's a scarecrow, or maybe, Halloween decorations since it's getting towards that time of year. But something about this figure on the fence doesn't sit right with him, so Aaron goes to check it out, and what he finds there gives him the shock of his life. It's not a scarecrow. It is a person beaten, blood-stained, freezing cold, and battered almost beyond recognition. Horrified, Aaron holds himself up, takes off, and hurries down to the first house he can find to call the police right away. Officers rushed out to the scene, and they are totally appalled by what they find because it's obvious at a glance that the first officer has just totally brutalized this person to get there. A woman named Reggie actually thinks the person is a child at first because they're so small. But the closer she looks, she's able to see a young man underneath his wounds. June Sharon reported for the BBC that despite his gruesome injuries, the young man is miraculously still breathing. While other officers and first responders arrive on the scene, Reddy tries to resuscitate him. But it's no use, and he's still unconscious by the time he's transported to the hospital in Laramie. Although the man's wallet and shoes are gone, doctors actually find his ID card from the University of Wyoming, which tells them that this young man's name is Matthew Shepard. It's pretty obvious to the doctor is that Matthew's injuries are way beyond what their little Laramie hospital can handle. So that same night, he's moved to a trauma unit out of state in Fort Collins, Colorado. Law enforcement officers are as horrified as Matthew's doctors because what Matthew suffered goes way beyond the average beating. His skull is fractured in multiple places. His brainstem is severely damaged. So even if somehow he does come out of this coma, doctors say that he'll never be the same again. I mean, to be beaten that severely, please have to be thinking that this is a personal attack like it's not random. That's exactly what they're thinking. And so right away, the Laramie police start really digging into Matthew Shepard to see who he was and to learn everything about him and understand who would have wanted to do something like this to him. Now they find out that he is an openly gay 21-year-old who was a freshman at the University of Wyoming. He grew up in Casper, but due to his dad's job in the oil industry, he spent time in places as diverse as Switzerland and Saudi Arabia. I mean, he was kind of all over the place. And actually, at the time of all of this, Matthew's parents are still living in Saudi Arabia, and when they find out what happened to him, they actually have to make the long trip back to the United States. But in the meantime, before they even get there, a woman named Tina has actually already called into the police and told them that she's worried about her friend because she hasn't been able to get in touch with him. They're asking her basic questions there, taking this information over the phone, they want to know, when did you see your friend last, stuff like that. And while Tina can't tell them anything about what her friend was doing before he went missing, she does tell the dispatcher a lot about him. This guy was young. He was sweet. Maybe a little damage, but a person with a bright future. And then she gives the dispatcher her friend's name. It's Matthew Shepard. A chill goes down the dispatcher's spine because, at that moment, the dots start to connect. They realize that Tina doesn't know, like she has no idea that her friend is sitting in the hospital and he's actually been found. So once the police make the connection, they contact Tina and start asking her some different questions. Did Matthew have any enemies? And was there anyone who'd want to hurt him? I mean, any lead that she could give them or point them in the right direction. One of the things that she tells police really stands out, and it's incredibly disturbing, she says. This isn't the first time that Matthew's been attacked, and the previous attacks on him were all perpetrated for one very specific reason because he was gay. Immediately, police start to wonder if this attack could also be related to that same reason. 
And what Tina doesn't know yet is that his most recent attackers are already on the police's radar for even more violent offenses. That happened that same night. What happened so early that morning? On October 7, there was a street fight in downtown Laramie with these two pairs of guys, two sets of friends, and basically, they started talking some trash to one another. When the pair of white guys start tossing around these racial slurs at the other two who were Latino teenagers named Emiliano and Jeremy. And then the situation escalated when one of the white guys actually pulled out a gun and pistol whipped Emiliano. Now Jeremy had this big stick on him. But that's how Emiliano describes it later to the Atlanta Constitution. So he hits the guy who just clubbed Emiliano and fearing for their lives. Now the white guys take off when the police show up. But they left behind their pickup truck, and when police searched the truck, they found a bloody 357 Magnum gun. A pair of shoes and a credit card with a name that didn't mean anything back then. But now it's a name that Laramie law enforcement knows well. The name on that credit card was Matthew Shepard. So these guys must be somehow connected to Matthew's case. Well, that's what it looks like. And not only are these two wanted for their connection to this street fight they're now wanted for something way worse and possibly being connected to Matthew now. Fortunately, this pickup truck connects police to its owner, a man named Bill McKinney, who says that his son Aaron, had borrowed it that night. A quick search of police records for the name Aaron McKinney actually shows Aaron has already got at least one criminal conviction to his name. He's actually awaiting to be sentenced for a robbing like a KFC, and he's currently in the hospital in Laramie being treated for a head injury. When police talked to him that night, and mind you, this is only a couple of hours after the call came in about Matthew being found out in that fence. Aaron says that he was out with his buddy Russell Henderson that night, but his truck was actually stolen. And he knows nothing about either the fight with Emiliano and Jeremy or about what happened to Matthew Shepard. But the police aren't buying this. They have a ton of physical evidence from the truck, like the bloody gun. They have shoes, they have credit cards, and this story about a missing truck is just too convenient. After all, he never reported it stolen, and his injuries match exactly what Emiliano and Jeremy described. So this investigation is moving fast. Within 48 hours, police interview both Aaron and Russell and their respective girlfriends, Kristen and Chastity. The two girls, who are like 18 and 20, come up with matching stories to tell police about watching movies together on the night Matthew was murdered. But their story falls apart pretty fast, and eventually, they actually admit that they helped get rid of some evidence. They finally tell police that they drove 50 miles to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to dump their bloody clothes. Because of this confession, Russell is arrested on October 8 and charged with the attempted first-degree murder of Matthew Shepard. He's charged with kidnapping and aggravated robbery, along with Kristen and Chastity, who are charged with being accessories after the fact. And a day later, on October 9, Aaron is arrested. Even though this investigation is moving fast, people talk even faster, and police in Laramie have no idea that the saga is just beginning. The media gets a hold of Matthew's assault pretty quickly, and the story explodes all across the country. Within days, word is already spreading that Matthew might have been attacked for being gay, and, according to the Democrat and Chronicle, by October 9th, Laramie police are already looking at this as a possible hate crime. Now, while all of this is going on, Matthew's parents are still making their way to his bedside in Colorado from Saudi Arabia. Now they stop in Minneapolis to pick up Matthew's little brother Logan so that they can continue the trip as a family. But while they're traveling, Matthew's mom, Judy, actually sees a picture of Matthew with the news of his attack as front-page headlines on the newsstands before she even gets to see her son in person, which imagines like seeing a picture of your child happy and healthy and knowing that when you finally go see them at their side, they're gonna be in so much pain, they might not even look like themselves anymore. So while the shepherds are completing the most painful journey of their lives, the police are still interrogating Aaron and Russell, and it's Aaron who breaks first, telling officers the full story. He tells police that he and Russell met Matthew at this bar called the Fireside in Laramie, and apparently, they had decided somehow that they were going to rob him. As Aaron tells it, the two men pretended to be gay to win Matthew's confidence and make him feel more comfortable with them. So at the end of the night, when Matthew was getting ready to leave, they said he had no problem accepting a ride and getting an Aaron's truck. 
At some point during this ride, Aaron says that Matthew put his hand on Aaron's leg. So Aaron told him, guess what? We're not gay, and we're going to jack you up. That's when they start to beat him. And it continued while they drove outside of Laramie to that open expanse in the middle of nowhere with a fence. Aaron says Russell's the one who actually tied Matthew to the fence, but that he's the one who kept beating Matthew with the butt of his gun into unconsciousness and past the point of no return. All while mocking him about how Gay Awareness Week was just about to happen at the University of Wyoming. And he says the entire time that he's doing this. Russell is just laughing in the background, thinking that this was the funniest thing in the world before they left. Aaron says that they actually took Matthew's shoes so that he wouldn't be able to walk back into town. And he said they continued to beat him specifically so that Matthew wouldn't even be able to see out of his eyes well enough to pick out the license plate number as they drove away. Now, they drive back into Laramie, which is when they get into that encounter with Emiliano and Jeremy. So with a full confession, the attempted murder charges actually get upgraded to murder after Matthew dies from his injuries on October 12, 1998, with his parents at his bedside. He never emerged from his coma, and the autopsy showed that he was struck at least 18 times with Aaron's gun, which led to multiple skull fractures and a severely damaged brainstem. The already frenzied media reports every savage detail while police keep working the case. Even with the confessions and the suspects in custody, the motive is at the forefront of everyone's mind. Was this really a robbery that gone wrong and literally as wrong as it could go? Or was this a targeted anti-gay hate crime? Aaron's girlfriend, Kristen, shed some light on it when she goes on 2020 and says quote, They just wanted to beat him up bad enough to teach him a lesson not to come on to straight people and don't be aggressive about it anymore. As the case progresses through the legal system, Aaron and Russell, instead of going to trial, Russell pleads guilty in April of 1999, two felony murder and kidnapping, and gets handed to life sentences. Aaron decides to take his chances, a try allows, and his defense team goes for a shocking tactic. They decide to use the gay panic defense. So that's an informal term because this defense isn't like a thing that stands on its own. The LGBT bar advocacy group defines it as a legal strategy that sasks a jury to find that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity slash expression is to blame for a defendant's violent reaction, including murder. End quote. So blaming the victims. So basically what this is saying is that the perpetrator's mental capacity was temporarily diminished and that they couldn't make clear, rational or right decisions because they were just so incensed or appalled or surprised or whatever, that their victim was an LGBTQ person. And so they say that they shouldn't be held to the normal standard of the law because it's the victim's fault for who they were. Basically, it comes down to just what it sounds like violently freaking out because someone isn't a heterosexual cisgender person can be excused, and the justice system has agreed and basically offers a reduced sentences or sometimes even tosses out the charges altogether in some cases now, at the time of Aaron's trial, this is back in October of 99. His team knows that the gay panic defense is a strategy that is totally legal in all 50 states at the time. So Tom Kenworthy reported in the Washington Post that Aaron's lawyers kind of hone in on the fact that Matthew allegedly made a pass at Aaron when he put his hand on Aaron's leg, which they argue that shed some light on Aaron's state of mind. They alleged that Aaron had been sexually assaulted by an older boy growing up, and that he was just so triggered and humiliated by Matthew's advances that he temporarily went crazy and beat him to death. And therefore they said that he should be convicted of manslaughter, not murder. Fortunately, Judge Barton Voigt is instant no. He cites Wyoming law banning temporary insanity and diminished capacity. Defense is, and he tells the Aaron's team to come up with something else now. In the end, justice prevails, and Aaron is found guilty of felony murder, second-degree murder, kidnapping and aggravated robbery, according to CNN. His lawyers work out a deal with the prosecutors to drop the felony murder conviction, which could have earned him the death penalty if Aaron agreed not to appeal his two consecutive life sentences and he takes the deal. But Matthew's murder starts a systemic shift in how LGBTQ rights and legal protections are talked about in the United States. I mean, we've seen this case held up and pointed so many times that it's really a part of the American legal landscape, and in the nearly 22 years since Matthew's death, there have been some new theories and controversies about whether or not this murder really was a hate crime.
There's like one person out there who's saying it had something to do with methamphetamines or a combination of factors. But regardless of what motivated the actions on that terrible night, a human still suffered a brutal fate. As of 2020 Matthew Shepard rests in the Washington National Cathedral. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson remain in prison, where they'll probably stay for the rest of their lives. If you have any recommendations for any case, please drop them down in the comments section. Thanks for watching.